Hello, April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and as promised, we wanted to meet today to discuss April being Sexual Assault Awareness Month and the importance of having this discussion surrounding Sexual Assault Awareness Month. So I'm just going to give people a few minutes to join us here, to hop on board with us in this conversation. Uh, while people are joining us, uh, then we'll be able to see if you have questions, you can put them in the comment section so we can see that. Uh, we always love to be able to see those those questions and comments that you may have. I see Lisa has joined us, and Lisa will be happy to help also. Lisa's with the Date Safe Project team. She'll be happy to take anybody's uh, questions and help answer that or point out to me any questions I may be missing so we can talk about April being Sexual Assault Awareness Month and the importance of having these discussions this month and really every month. But as we know in our country, we pick certain months to really have intense, deeper, more a larger massive level of acknowledgement of certain issues such as in this case sexual assault which is why april is sexual assault awareness month so we can dive deeper into these conversations which is so important for us to be able to do thanks kate for joining us uh, that's awesome uh, some of you might notice that in the comments lisa's already put her email so that you can contact her if you do have questions or you'd like more follow-up during this discussion uh, and what I always like to do is just give a minute or two for people to be able to join us before we really kick in the conversation. So, Kate, since you're one of the first people to join us here today, uh, please feel free to have a question. I, you, you said, hey, hey, so I'm saying hey back to you. But for anybody watching right now, if you have questions in regards to maybe how we can help people discuss consent, bystander intervention, supporting survivors, uh, that is a great time to do that in the comment section. By the way, if you make a comment like you like this or you love this or you make comments like that or you, the sad face, we see all that. So we can react to that too, which is always wonderful to be able to see what all of you are thinking, uh, what you're, if you have questions, so we can dive into those. Uh, and so that's what it's really about. Now, with April being Sexual Assault Awareness Month, typically this month, and it's true this year also, I am very busy on military installations uh, throughout the country, sometimes around the world, and this month is no different. We're doing a lot of work with the U.S. military, and the military does a great job of saying, hey, this is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Let's uh, really increase the amount of awareness, uh, promotion that we're having, discussing how to help solve this problem, and really give our military service members skills to be able to address these issues. And let me be very clear. I work with the military year-round, so for anybody who might be thinking, well, geez, they only address it in April when it's Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Not the case at all. Not at least with the people I work with in the military. Uh, they are very diligent about addressing this year-round. It's just that in April, they do maybe put in some extra resources to make sure they're honoring the month for the importance that it has. So we're doing a ton of work with the military. I mean, last week would be a great example uh, the last few weeks, uh, we were in D.C., we were in North Dakota, we were in Florida, just going from base to base to base uh, to this week, I'll be in at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. Then I'll be up, I believe it's, if I remember the top of mind, I think I'm at Fort Gordon on Friday. Uh, and that's how it works. That's Thursday to Friday. And we're already on Tuesday. So that gives you a little vibe. Next week, every day, I'm at an installation, a military installation somewhere in the United States, literally Monday through Friday. Uh, and, and that's how it goes. And we love being able to spread this message and this mission year-round, but April giving a little extra attention so people have the conversation. And that's what Awareness Months do. They help maybe get people going in a conversation they might not typically have. And that's the idea here, is for us to do that. So today we're going to discuss why we're doing that, why that's so important. For everyone listening, thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Solomon, for joining us. If none of you know, she has a great book called a loving bravely that is fantastic and really in line with what we teach about consent. And so thank you for joining us. You put, what can junior high schools do to foster a culture of respect among preteen boys? Great question, Dr. Solomon. I'm going to change it up a little bit just for everyone listening. And I'm going to say for all genders. Uh, so in addition to preteen boys, what we can do for all genders at the middle school level to try to help address these topics. And it's really about what is a healthy relationship? What is healthy sexual intimacy? And the key word here is mutual. See, for too long, consent was addressed as a word of permission, something you had to get to get what you wanted is how a lot of people would misconstrue consent. I need consent to get what I want versus viewing consent as 
an agreement that you both want to have a mutual wonderful experience together and you're able to discuss what you want what you don't want so at all ages the concepts the same whether middle school high school university military family life for those who may be married or in long-term relationships the concepts the same instead of going from a permission based concept of consent think about a mutual based concept of consent that we both want to experience this, that all partners want to experience this, that you are making sure that you know what your partner likes. So as people might go, well, geez, if they're in middle school, how are you having these conversations? They're not even able to consent according to the law. It's true. And we also know, just like underage drinking, there can be a lot of sexual activity that is happening before the legal age of consent, just like we know occurs with alcohol. And so we need to be able to talk about, all right, if it is taking place, how do we discuss the skill sets needed so that it's not violent, it's not done against someone's will? We know it cannot legally give consent, but you may still want to talk about, hey, how do you intervene when you see a friend in an unhealthy relationship? How do you say no? Uh, but the, what we want to first do is teach the importance of what a mutually wonderful, healthy relationship looks like. That's the beginning foundation, starting point. And when we say relationship, that in this case, we're brought in to talk about sexual intimacy specific. So what does a sexual relationship look like? Is it a gift? Is the body being treated like the temple it's meant to be treated by? Like, that's really important, right? So are we treating the body like a temple? Is the body a gift? Hello, Holly, thanks for joining us. I, I see that you've just uh, joined us in the conversation. And these are all key conversations at age appropriate levels as young as possible. What does a healthy relationship look like? What does a healthy sexual relationship look like? What does it mean to have mutually wonderful sexual intimacy? What does that even mean? Like, I can put that up on a board with adults, and they go, I don't know that I know the right answer to that. And they're adults. And I, when I'm talking adults, I'm not even saying just adults. I mean, as in they just turned adults. I can throw that up on a board with 30, 40, 50, 60-year-olds. And they'll go, Mike, I'm not sure I know what that is. And so for us to look at middle scores and go, well, they should know the right thing to do, when people don't know the right understanding of mutual intimacy at 40 years older than them, 50 years older than them, you can't beat up on the middle schoolers for not knowing what we haven't taught them. What we have to be able to do is teach middle schoolers what the whole concept is and then the skill set to make sure that happens. And if you're thinking, but if I teach them the skill set, they might engage at things at an age before they're ready to. Actually, if you teach them the skill set, they will not pressure anyone into doing something they're not ready to do. They'll have more of a voice they'll feel comfortable expressing. So if somebody's trying to do something with them before they're legally able to do that with that person, they'll have a skill set to be able to say, uh, no, not ready yet, uh, not at the right age yet. And they'll know how to address comments like, well, if you loved me, if you don't, I'm going to tell people this. They'd have a skill set to address the pressure that's involved, and it would actually make it a safer world for everyone because everyone would have a voice. Everyone's boundaries would be respected. That's so critically important. And this all started from the question from Dr. Solomon about, hey, how do we have this conversation when it comes to middle schoolers? And it's true of all ages, like we said, in all genders, right, that it should be about mutuality versus just getting what I want, or how do I get some, and I need consent to get some, versus how do we have a mutual experience. Now, if you're sitting there going, well, Mike, what if it's a one-night stand? Is that really about mutual experience? It should be. You're involving another human being, or more. I don't know how many partners, but at least one other human being. And therefore, if you're involving another human being, their boundaries, their wants, their wishes, their likes, their dislikes, should all be valued, just as yours should be. Now, that doesn't mean you have to do what they like or what they want. You shouldn't have to do anything you don't want to do. It should be a mutual, which means you find the things you both mutually want to experience together. And when you're of legal age and of sound mind, that's something you can both love exploring with each other. Now, if you're somebody coming from a place of faith saying, geez, that shouldn't happen in a one-night stand, I understand that coming from a place of faith, you might say that goes against your beliefs and your values. Totally get that. And I'm not judging that one way or the other. When we're working with communities, we have to talk of all people, whether coming from a place of faith or not. We have to talk from a legal place. We have to talk from an all-encompassing perspective. And therefore, when we're in a place of faith, we can have that conversation. And sometimes we're not able to have that conversation because it's not appropriate to do so. So when I'm having the conversation, I'm assuming that you're going to put those values and those beliefs you personally have into the conversation because they fit. No matter where you're coming from, treating another human being with respect should fit in your faith. 
uh, and should come from a place that most people have believe has strong values. And so that's a wonderful gift that you can share with your partner, no matter where you're coming from. Now also, Kate asked, what's the best way to address consent and assault with a popu population promoting abstinence? Well, oh my gosh, Kate, that's like perfect timing of what we just discussed. So I get brought in and contracted and hired very commonly by institutions that believe in abstinence only. And people hear this and go, wait, time, time out, time out, Mike, that can't be right. You're telling us that you're being brought in by organizations that say you are not to engage in sexual intimacy and you're teaching them a skill set for how to ask, how to respect each other's boundaries. How does that go together? Like, doesn't that battle beliefs? How do they blend together? Well, you might have noticed, I just mentioned before, they actually blend perfectly together. Here's why. If you believe in abstinence only, you're always going to want to believe in the concept of asking first. Because if your partner asks you, you have the opportunity to say, no, I don't believe in doing this until. Okay, and so then you can fill in the blank. If nobody's teaching asking, your partner just makes their move on you until you say no or stops them which is a messed up system we've taught people. And that's on the person. That, that responsibility is on the person doing the touching. And we put the onus, unfortunately, on the person who's being touched to say no or stop them. That's messed up. Now notice the person might have already been touched where they didn't want to be touched. Their values already breached where they didn't want them to be breached. Had they been asked, they could have said no, and none of that may have happened. Therefore, honoring the temple of their body by first being asked first and being able to say no. Therefore, treating that abstinence is a choice that I want to engage in and I want to have a voice in that moment. It's really, really valuable. So if you believe in teaching abstinence, you want to teach asking first. You also want to teach respecting the answer, that you don't guilt somebody into doing something they don't want to do. That falls in line with abstinence, waiting so that it's special and it's wonderful to give between the two of you. Now, most people who believe in abstinence believe in what I just said there at the end, that it's a gift to be treasured, honored, and respected. When I say it, we're referring to sexual intimacy, is a gift to be treasured and honored and respected at all times. Well, it's a gift. Have you given this generation or the ones you love the skill set to treat like a gift? Really important question there. Think about that. How have I given my children or the generation that's coming up a specific skill set to make sure that when they engage in sexual intimacy, it's treated like the gift it's meant to be. Now, that means they need detailed knowledge, not words like, well, just be good to your partner or just, you know, make sure you're doing what they want. That's not a skill set. That's, that's more of a, of a concept. A skill set is what is the exact question you might ask a partner to know what they like or don't like sexually or that they're ready for or not ready for. What are the exact words you'd use in that moment that are realistic, that are caring, that allow you to listen, and that are sincere? It's not a game. It's not trying to win something over. And, and what are words that you would feel comfortable and enjoy using in that moment? See, that's giving somebody a skill set. Helping them find the words to use in that moment becomes so, so important. So when we talk about abstinence, we need to think about, yes, that fits in the conversation. It's not uh, abstinence over here and then talking about consent over here. Nope, nope. This is all talking about healthy relationships, intimacy, and how they all, all these choices play in. Now, let me give you the, one of the biggest mistakes people make when they talk about abstinence that loses all credibility with audiences. When I say audience, that could be an audience of one, your child, or that could be a classroom of students. Here's a massive mistake people make. They say that abstinence is the safest form of sex. Now, I just want you to pause for a second and think about that. When you say that, most teenagers and adults will look at you like you do not make any sense. Here's why. Abstinence can be a wonderful choice, a fantastic, wonderful, healthy, uh, it can be a faith-based choice for whatever, it can be a wonderful choice. Sexual activity at the right time in one's life can be a wonderful choice choice, right? But they are, this over here, abstinence, is not a form of this sexual activity. Once I choose to be sexually active, right? Once I choose to, I'm leaving abstinence. I'm leaving abstinence, right? I'm, I am no longer abstinent at that point. I'm becoming sexually active. So you can't say that not engaging in sexual activity 
is the safest form of sexual activity. It doesn't make sense. They're sitting there listening going, it doesn't make sense. How about saying that abstinence is a wonderful choice because we're all about teaching choice. is a wonderful choice. And when you're ready to be sexually active, this is a different choice. They're not the same. So you can't call one part of the other. All right, now, you can say that they can be on a pathway, right, that maybe you start from a place of absence and you go to a place of sexual intimacy, but it's still going from one to the other. It's, it's not a form of the same thing. So that becomes very, very important to discuss. Uh, and so I hope that makes sense. Uh, I'm going to scroll down here because some people have been asking some really good questions. I want to make sure uh, that we address everyone's questions there. Um, and, and I love all the conversation. This is great. Uh, so we're going to move down here. And uh, we're going to see, uh, oh, Sean, you're saying thanks that we're bringing this to uh, Facebook. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of inviting local sexual assault prevention educators into schools? I'm thrilled to talk about that, Sean, because we're a big fan of that. Uh, what we've gone to is we actually provide a program called Education Through Engagement where we go into regions. Uh, this past November, December, we were in South Dakota, and people from North Dakota and South Dakota came in, and we trained local educators from sexual assault crisis centers on how to go into their communities and be more interactive, uh, try to be more effective in their style of education so they could be more powerful in getting these lessons out to their local communities. It is pivotally important that local sexual assault crisis centers are being integrated into the local educational systems because that is your resource for survivors to turn to. And if you do not bring in the local sexual assault crisis center and you're an educator, you're in a school system, and you say, well, there's these resources out there, but the students never see them. They don't see them as people. It can seem like this scary resource that if I reach out to, ah, I don't know what this is. It seems weird. It feels awkward. Versus if you say, hey, today in the classroom, we've brought in, brought in a local educator from the local sexual assault crisis center. Now they see a person like a face and they're friendly and they're positive and they're engaging. And students in the room realize, oh, I have another resource. I can go talk to them. I can ask them questions. If I'm a survivor, maybe I can talk to them today. Maybe I can ask them a question I need to ask them. So for instance, when I go speak in a local community, everywhere I go, military installations, middle schools, high schools, universities, uh, national conferences, they get a packet from us. And one of the things you're gonna see in that packet you get from us when you bring Mike to speak is, please invite the local sexual assault crisis center. We make this a strong point on one of the first pages because we want them integrated. We want them to be an ongoing resource for that community. It's not about just, hey, we, we have a speaker and it's only about the speaker. No, it's about creating a movement. And we want the local resources there to help create that movement. So, Sean, awesome question there. Just a wonderful question there about that process of how we do that. And so, yes, we want to integrate those. Um, do I have Twitter? Amanda, great question. We do have Twitter. Uh, and I have Twitter and the Date Save Project has Twitter. So if you're trying to find me on Twitter, I believe nowadays Lisa's going to correct me because I know she's watching if I'm wrong, but I believe I'm twitter.com slash Mike Damish. I'm going to spell that out because it is, although if you're on Facebook, you can see it up in the corner of my profile. It's D-O-M-I-T-R-Z. So Mike Damish. So that's at Mike Damish. If you're trying to find the Date Safe Project Twitter feed, uh, that is at Date Safe Project. So just like it sounds, at Date Safe Project. Safe as in you want to feel safe. Date Safe Project. So great question. Uh, Lisa is asking, how do we best support survivors of sexual assault? And I wanted to wait on this, so I'm glad we're discussing it now. I wanted to wait till we're really deep into this conversation because uh, I want to make sure we had everybody aboard on this chat to be able to dive into this. And I want to first back up and talk about why this month is so important. And I didn't dive into that sooner. I wanted to wait till we have had everybody uh, joining us in the video conversation. For me, this is personal. 1989, I receive a phone call that my sister's been sexually assaulted and uh, I can't believe what I'm hearing. I'm in shock. I'm enraged. I am lost. I'm confused. And I would go on a journey after that. I would hear a speaker speak. I would see the strength of my sister, the Sherry, that was just so incredible, so inspiring. I would, like I said, hear a speaker in college that would make me think maybe I can speak out. And over the next few months and year, I would dig deep into what, how I could have a conversation on this, how I could start this conversation. And keep in mind, I was a college student. I was 
19 years old when it happened. I was 20, 21 when I started speaking out. And there just wasn't, there wasn't a track to have a conversation. Like you couldn't just turn and go, oh, here's this resource I can turn to and talk to. It wasn't available then. Colleges were barely talking about if they were talking about it at all. High schools were not discussing this. And that's when I realized, oh my gosh, nobody's talking about this. So 27 years later, 28 years later now, for me to sit and look back at this conversation and see how many people are doing so much in April during Sexual Assault Awareness Month means the world to me. And I know it does for everybody out there in this movement because it's come so far. And we still have a long ways to go. See, if we're going to end sexual assault, which is really the goal of Sexual Assault Awareness Month long term, or if we're going to dramatically bring it down, the frequency of it, the, the amount sexual violence takes place, if we're going to dramatically bring that down, we have to have a shift in how we think. We, we have to go from the thinking of how do we stop rape, which is the old way of thinking, like how do we stop rape, which is a, a th when you think that way, there's a concept of you believe rape is always going to take place. Therefore, it's how to stop it or how to put a Band-Aid to a tragedy. And it's too much of a tragedy to think how to put a Band-Aid. It's a horrible belief system when people say, oh, how do, you know, how do we just take care of it once it happens? That's critically important. It is critically important that we are there for survivors. Critically important. How do we help intervene when we see these scenes taking place? Where we need to get to is how to have a culture where behaviors that lead to rape and sexual assault are in no way acceptable. So that when you even see a person starting to engage in behavior in any way whatsoever that tries to use power over another person, such as using alcohol to facilitate sexual assault, trying to coerce a, a partner into a situation they don't want to do, you even see a sign of it. It's such a red flag. Like, oh my gosh, can you believe that's happening? Like you, you're, you react that strongly. Like, I can't believe that's happening. Oh my gosh, I need to do something. We need to get to that place where those behaviors make us that enraged. We're there in some crimes. Like, if we were to talk about sexual assault of a child, pedophilia, people get that enraged. If you were to say, oh my gosh, a child over there, it looks like somebody's being inappropriate. People are like, where? Where is, that, where is that happening? We need to stop that, which is the right reaction. We all know that's the right reaction. What if we could have that strong of a reaction when you're at a bar and you see somebody just handing over drinks to try to get someone out of the bar by themselves? Or at a party and you see that behavior. Or you're with a friend and they're bragging that, yeah, my, my partner was a little drunk last night, so I had a little extra fun. And you, and you actually are appalled and disgusted by the statement. And some of you could be listening going, I would be appalled. But those statements are made all the time in our society. And people are not appalled. So that everybody would be appalled. And be like, what? What did you just say? And realize how disgusting and messed up that is. That's where we need to get to. Now to get there, that means we have to be on a mission to try to achieve a new cultural norm. That's what we have to get to. And to achieve that cultural norm... I believe the mission, and this is something I personally and deeply focused on, is the following phrase. That anytime somebody engages in sexual intimacy, it should be pursued only upon the concept that it's going to be mutually amazing consensual sexual intimacy. And that's what, how it should be pursued, and that should be the only way it's pursued. That's my belief. Because if our whole culture was doing that, that means our, if you're thinking, I'm going to get some tonight, it can't be about you just getting some because it has to be mutual. So it has to be about two people, at least partners, wanting this to occur. It's a different concept. That means that no one ever goes to a bar thinking, oh, who's had a few, you know, that person, a few more drinks will help them get comfortable with me. Nobody would think that way because culture would say that's messed up. You don't give somebody a few extra drinks so they'll have sex with you. If they don't want to have sex with you sober, you shouldn't have sex with them. That will be the norm. That's what we want to get to. So sexual assault is not taking place in the first place. Now, I know we're still going to have the serial predator potentially out there who literally is missing the ability brain-wise to have the wiring to recognize what they're doing. Uh, and not just to say recognize. I don't want to say that because sometimes predators are absolutely aware of what they're doing is wrong. But to actually have the wiring to stop it from happening. There are people in our society that do not have the wiring to be able to stop and say what I'm doing is too harmful to others and therefore I won't do it. Like they don't have the whole wiring for that. That doesn't excuse them at all. 
In fact, we need to make our culture safer by making sure those people cannot harm others. And, when, and we need to hold everyone accountable. So if somebody's missing that, that doesn't mean, oh, we, we now say because you're missing that wiring, you don't have to be held accountable. for something. Nope, nope. Everyone needs to be held accountable that commits a sexual assault. And we need to keep everyone safe from those individuals. Absolutely. So I'm just having a little side conversation there because I don't want anybody to misconstrue that part. Really important. But we want to get to a society where any form of setting up an advantage over another human being sexually is not okay. It's not okay. It should always be mutual. Now, we are in a society where sexual assault is happening. And therefore, we need to be able to talk about how do we help survivors come forward. And that's what Lisa was asking was, hey, Mike, can you talk about that? Because too often when people talk about survivors coming forward, they make some mistakes. And what they do is they think they're being loving, but what they're actually being is overprotective. Here's what I mean by that, and even controlling. Parents, we can be the worst at this sometimes. And I say we because I'm a parent. Parents want to protect, and they feel that if they say certain words, it'll protect their child. And really what the words are about is making the parent feel better that they did something, they said something. But it doesn't mean it's effective. Let me give you a classic example of a parent mistake in this realm sit down their child the child's about to date or go into a party and the parent says something like this if anyone ever touches you i'll kill them now when i do that in front of audiences the whole audience laughs and i'll say if you've ever said those words or heard those words say yes i have like 95 percent of the audiences everywhere says yes i have and nobody's like, they're laughing because of how ridiculous the statement is. And then I'll say, is the child more likely to come forward after that statement or less likely, like they're more likely to pull back? Everybody knows the answer, but we just aren't having the conversation. Everybody knows the answer is, well, they're way less likely to tell you if you make that statement. They're going to be scared to tell their parents then or anybody because they're afraid their parents might find out. And those statements are incredibly harmful. See, the parents thought that if I say, if anybody touches you, I'm going to kill them. My child's going to hear love. What your child's going to see is your concept of vengeance. And that's not about, I'm going to be here for you, the child. It's about what I'm going to do to this other person over here. And your child needs to know you're going to be there for them. That's critically important. Or your loved ones, or those you lead. So here's what you say instead. You go home tonight, and you sit down with your loved ones. Or maybe you Skype them, or you call them. But it's a conversation. It's not a text. It needs to be a conversation. So where you can either hear and or see each other. You look them in the eyes. Now imagine you're doing this, for instance, with a sibling, a partner, or a child. And say the following words. If anyone ever sexually touches you against your will, without your consent, I am always going to be here for you. Always. See, with those words, you let the survivor know I'm here for you. Not about getting the other person. Right now I'm here for you. And that's what they need to know, that there's going to be a safe place for them to come forward. Keyword, safe. And if you're focused on violence, that's not a safe place necessarily for a survivor to come forward. You need to be a safe place. Now, here's the other keywords. You need to be ready for if they say to you, that's happened to me. Because you just opened the doorway for a survivor to come in. And we want the survivor to be able to step in. Right? We want to be able to support them. So you need to be ready. Now, if somebody you love says, that's happened to me. There are two mistakes people commonly make. And mistakes, I mean that they can do harm in the survivor continuing to talk. I don't mean you're meaning to do harm. I mean accidentally. But we want to address that. All right. One is to say this. Who did it? See, when you show that anger and that vengeance, it now sounds like you're not focused on the loving person in front of you, the survivor, but what you're going to do after this information, you receive this information to this other human being, which could very much scare the survivor. So it's not a strong reaction, right? And when I say strong, healthy reaction, right? The other reaction is, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And this looks like pity often to a survivor. And it sounds like pity. And that's not helpful either. So what do you do? When somebody's telling you this information, you take a breath. So you can catch yourself and you show that you care, right? That you're not just trying to think of, I'm going to say the right thing, I'm going to say the right thing. Instead, take a breath. Maybe it doesn't have to be that obvious. Just take a breath. Look them in the eye and say, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Clearly, you are strong. You are courageous. What can I do to help? And then you listen. 
you listen. Don't think of what you should ask for questions. You're not an investigator. This is not the purpose of this conversation. It is for you to listen and provide support to the survivor. These words are critically important. All right, and then what you do is you listen and you let them know that their resources, they deserve to know. You don't say you should do this. That's telling someone what to do. It could be guilting them, not ideal. It feels like their choice is being taken away again. Instead, you deserve to know that there's a local crisis center. That's great language. You deserve to be able to talk with somebody who can really, really provide you the support at this moment you most deserve. And I want, I'm here to love you and be here for you. And I also know that I, I might not be the best person. And so I want to be able to help you get to the right person, right? And so you want to hear that? That's loving. That's not, ooh, I'm not the right person. You need to talk to somebody else. That's, that's not what we're doing. We're not doing that. We're doing, I want to be here for you. I want to listen. And I want to help you get the right resources. And then let them know about the local sexual assault crisis center 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Offer, would you like me to go with you? Would you like me to drive you? These can be great, great resources. Would you like me to call for you? These can be great resources, right? Be a supportive person through the process, not a driver taking over the situation and saying, here's what we're gonna do. Now we're gonna do this, now we're gonna do that. This needs to be, the survivor needs to feel empowered, not somebody controlling them. Remember, someone just took away their choices. We don't wanna repeat in any way that kind of behavior. So that's where I wanna be able to do that. Thank you, Reggie, by the way, for your kind words there. I appreciate that. Uh, Kate asked, what is the best way to not overkill our message of consent? I'll tell you that what I notice people complain about the most when it comes to overkill on talking about consent. It's not that we're talking too much about it. It's the way people are talking about it. They're not making it fun, right? I just said that consent should be mutually wanted, enthusiastically given. I said that earlier. And ongoing, by the way. Ongoing, mutually wanted, enthusiastically given. That should be fun. So when we talk about consent, make it fun. Ask the audience, what would be a fun way to be asked? What would be a fun way to have this conversation? And make it fun. Intimacy should be fun. We talked earlier, some people, if you're coming from a place of faith, you'll teach it often as it's a gift from God. Yes, so treat it like a gift. It should be wonderful. You know, I, I'll jokingly with audience sometimes say, look, if it's not fun, somebody's doing something wrong. Maybe both are doing something wrong, but something's not right. It should be fun. It should be fantastic. And sometimes it's not fun because people don't even have the knowledge to know what it means to be fun with intimacy. They don't know how to make it comfortable. And so the more you can make it about, hey, what does mutually amazing consensual sexual intimacy look like. Right? That's fun. I remember the first time I sort of had this light bulb moment of going from I want to end sexual assault to I want a culture of sexual intimacy that's based on mutually amazing consensual sexual intimacy. And I was in front of people that do not do this work that I do. And I was not in front of people that are passionate about this topic at all. And the, the whole group was like, I want some of that. Like I'm in on that. I would love to learn more about that. That's, and I was like, oh my gosh, this should be where we head. And this was years ago, and it shifted everything for me. And so if you're thinking, sitting out there going, how do, I, how do I have this conversation? How do you make it fun? That's the conversation, right? That's teaching consent. And Sexual Assault Awareness Month, this month, is about all these elements. Consent, bystander intervention, supporting survivors. We just did a whole piece there on supporting survivors. And by the way, all that language is in our book, Can I Kiss You? about how to, the right words to say, how to ask for a survivor, how to ask for a kiss. All of these questions are in the book, Can I Kiss You? But also, I really want to stress, you get our free book. We have a free book called Voices of Courage. 12 survivors sharing their stories. It is amazingly powerful. It's completely free. And by the way, that includes the audiobook, completely free, which means you get to hear the actual 12 survivors talk to you. Now, if you're wondering, hey, where do I get this from? Lisa just put a link to it in the comment section of this video. So you can see download Voice, Voices of Courage free, date safe. You see a little image there that says Ask Mike. That is a free link. No catch, no gimmick. A wonderful way to have this conversation because I didn't write that book. I just brought the survivors together to write that book. Each survivor wrote their own chapter. They worked with our editing team, but they wrote their own chapter. It's their voice. You really get to hear their perspective and you get to be inspired by their strength and their courage. And that's, if nothing else about April, let's hope that everybody steps up to the plate and honoring and acknowledging the strength and courage inside of every survivor. Every means all genders, all sexual orientations, all identities, all survivors have courage and strength inside them.
Sometimes I'll meet a survivor who says, I haven't found mine yet, but they know that they, by me even saying that, they like hearing that because they're like, okay, it's in me. I got to help bring it forward. And that helps them. They share with us that all the time that yes, I have courage and strength and it's finding it inside us. And that's, that's true of a lot of us, finding that courage and strength. But for survivors to hear that is so important in a society that too frequently puts the onus or the focus wrongly on the survivor. That's why on this topic, especially we need to talk about how strong and courageous survivors are because of what they have to sometimes go against with society norms. That is, it's an, it's unfair, it's unfortunate and it can be damaging. And it, it takes that extra courage and strength that survivors have. I wouldn't be doing this work without survivors that and right without Sherry. I'm not doing this work without my sister being my initial inspiration to this work. I'm not doing this work. And so that's really critically important as we wrap up here talking about April being Sexual Assault Awareness Month, that we keep that in mind. I want to thank everybody who's joined us on this video. Now, if you're watching it later, uh, thank you for joining us also because, as you can see, we had a lot of different conversations here today. With April being Sexual Assault Awareness Month, we wanted to have this conversation and really let it go where it went today, and you all allowed that to happen by joining us. Thank you so much. Remember, if you want more information, go to datesafeproject.org datesafeproject.org is our website. Thank you for all the likes out there and all the loves. Love that. Thank you so much. Come join us online, datesafeproject.org. Share this video. We would love to have you share this video to help others have the conversations because we included a lot of skill sets here that people could share with others. So please share the video. Let's get this message out there. Let's really make this April a special month for Sexual Assault Awareness Month, really making a difference in this world, spreading the mission. If you're on Twitter, we're at Date Safe Project uh, or at Mike Domish. Somebody asked that earlier. Great question. YouTube, we're at youtube.com slash Date Safe Project. Facebook, Facebook.com slash date safe. This is my personal page. Follow me here. We love hearing from all of you. Thank you. And let's make April truly extra special. We've still got two weeks left to make that happen. Thanks, everyone.